The genius of the British race is exemplified not only in its great poets and playwrights, but also in the men in the shops and drawing offices. Britain's industry depends on her craftsmen, the wheelwright, the man who makes wheels, the shipwright, the man who builds ships, whether he works in wood or in steel. And now the tubewright, a craftsman in tubular steel structures. Most people think that tubes or pipes are used only to convey fluids and gases, but the steel tube is also an ideal structural member. There is nothing new in tubular construction. Nature herself, that unrivaled engineer, provides the best examples and always uses hollow structural members where compressive or buckling stresses occur. An ear of corn is supported by a tubular stalk. The weight carried is relatively large, the center of gravity high up, and stresses due to wind can become severe under storm conditions. Birds are another example of how nature has dealt with the problem of weight saving combined with maximum strength. The quill of each feather is a thin-walled tube, subject to heavy stresses due to its being cantilevered or supported at one end only. The great engineers of the 19th century well knew the advantages of the hollow section. Robert Stevenson, in 1850, built the tubular bridge over the Menai Strait in the form of two tunnels in rectangular sections made of wrought iron plates riveted together. Rectangular section. For, of course, the hollow section need not necessarily be circular. For more than a hundred years, this bridge has carried an increasing weight of rail traffic to Anglesey. The fourth bridge, built in 1889, was at that time the largest bridge in the world and is a fine example of the use of the round hollow section. It was constructed from rolled steel plates, formed into tubes, and riveted like an old-fashioned boiler casing. Nevertheless, despite these impressive examples, little headway was made in tubular steel engineering, owing to the difficulty of making cheap and efficient tube-to-tube -tube connections. Stewart's and Lloyd's were naturally among the first to use steel tubes for constructional purposes. In 1906, they built the roof trusses of their Clyde offices from tubes with screwed and bolted connections and issued a catalogue dealing with its use of the steel tube. But for nearly 40 years, there was little progress in this branch of engineering, as the problem of joining the tubes efficiently and economically still remained. However, just as the advantages of bamboo as a structural member in scaffolding were known throughout the East, so the strength of the steel tube with various types of mechanical joints has been utilized for many years for scaffolding in other parts of the world. In many places, tubular scaffolding has taken the place of heavy balks of timber to shore up buildings. Hundreds of miles of steel tube were used along the coronation route for seating and stand, where the safety factor was so important. Safety of a different kind has been secured by using the strength of the steel tube to combat coastal erosion. Three-inch steel tubes with spacing girders top and bottom trap the stones and shingles, and in the course of time, the sea builds up its own breakwater. In cities and towns everywhere, steel tube is extensively used for lighting columns and other street furniture, as they call it. Temporary islands and barriers of tubular steel are light yet strong, easily moved and stacked for transport. Nearly all coach and bus shelters, too, are tubular structures. Ship's masts, derricks and booms are an application where the strength compared with the weight of the steel tube is used to full advantage. This factor of strength with lightness was put to good use during the war in bridge building. The Ingalls Bridge was made from steel tube with mechanical joints. The experience gained in the use of steel tube as a structural member and the great advances in welding technique and equipment enabled the tube right at last to join tubes efficiently and cheaply. This opened up a wide field, for instance, in new types of bridges, 
The Brook Bridge, welded up in tubular steel units, can span nearly 60 feet without intermediate support. And the Usk Bridge, which can span up to 120 feet, is built up from standard welded units. A big advance was the Southampton Car Bridge, the first pontoon bridge of its kind in the world. This bowstring bridge was erected on the dockside and then lifted bodily into position. These light or welded bridges can be erected speedily and easily on the site and point the way to the future. Another wartime development which has reappeared in civilian guise is the tubular steel servicing platform providing light but rigid steps. and a hydraulic platform which can be adjusted to varying heights for servicing aircraft in the jet age. From service platforms to railway gantries, in the electrification of the British railway system, steel tubes are used experimentally in place of angle sections because of their high strength to weight ratio. But it has been standard practice for some years in the design of crane jibs such as this Luffing crane in the London dock. For all types of materials handling gear too, the steel tube is eminently suitable. Tubular steel crates and stillages have been designed for many trades. For instance, at the Manhattan works of Jute Industries Limited, Dundee, the most modern jute mill in the world, yarn and cloth are moved along the production lines by stillages for the flat, easily stackable items and crates for awkward loads such as the spools or cheeses. Not only does this type of equipment provide efficient handling on the floor, but its strength and lightness make it most convenient for interworks transfer of materials. Moving materials from floor to floor is just as easy with these crates. A bar through the top, lifting gear, and the trays of cops arrive at the looms. As in other industries, continuous production requires an uninterrupted flow of materials. Feeding these circular looms is facilitated by this equipment. Below the looms, an unusual type of stillage holds the endless tube of cloth before it is cut into sack lengths. This type of equipment is made up from tubes welded in permanent form, as the materials in this mill do not vary in shape or size. Where the materials differ in shape and size, tube rights have devised the patent demountable pallet system. The assembly of the standard components is simplicity itself. With a deck, feet, studs and domes, a stillage can be assembled. or with four posts added, a post pallet. A rack is made by the addition of another deck and further posts, or with side and end panels, crates, to meet all factory requirements. In their motor car division, Rolls-Royce have adopted this new pallet system. Every lathe and machine has its own type of pallet to hold the completed work for inspection and examination. The type of pallet or crate varying according to need. In these Rolls-Royce stores, there are 29,000 different kinds of spare parts and components, all stacked in the minimum of space, yet instantly at hand whenever required. Carried by a stacking truck, the flanged feet position themselves simply and accurately. Pallet units can be made up into post pallets of different design, which are stacked at easily accessible points around each particular job. The use of the hollow section in the form of steel tube is comparatively recent in this type of equipment, but already, in addition to the motor industry, it has been widely adopted for the food, electrical, public transport and heavy engineering industries. <laughs> 